Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role playing games and lots of them. I upload twice a week with a live stream every weekend. You can also find me on Subscribestar, Patreon and Discord, Facebook and Twitter. Also, there's an option to join the channel as a member and I welcome any questions you have in the comment section down below. As always, if you like this video or this channel, hit that like button and subscribe if you would be so kind. Returning to the vast variety that is the millions of crystal spheres floating in the rainbow-hued phlogiston gas of the Prime Material Plane. There are dangers of stupendous size a Spelljammer crew may encounter, but one of the worst threats to many worlds of the Prime Material Plane is actually quite small face to face. They don't really seem that impressive, but facing them in nearly limitless numbers in the form of a vast machine swarm consuming all resources, annihilating all organic life, leaving nothing but sterile planets and clouds of pulverized asteroids in their wake, that's another thing altogether. This is the apocalypse of the clockwork horrors, and it is coming. In today's video, I'll be covering everything that is known about the clockwork horrors, their origins, operations, and tactics. I'll also be adding some additional details at the end of the video that is option optional inspirational stuff that I've added to the lore for my games, along with some theoretical stuff to get your mental cogs and gears working overtime. So where did the clockwork horrors originate? Somewhere far off in the prime material plane on a world populated by a now extinct race of humanoids which are referred to now simply as the lost ones. They are the authors of a very sad tale really. As they reached a technological age the species had a fascination with artifice creating all manner of automatons and golems to perform day to day tasks entertaining them and freeing them from the strife and hardship ushering in a golden age where they were free to explore more esoteric knowledge their basic needs catered to by a tireless workforce. This much is told as part of the Ecology article in Dragon Magazine issue 350 published in December 2006 written by Eric Cagle and illustrated beautifully by Peter Bergting. I really like the illustrations for this article as there are very few images of the clockwork horrors found elsewhere. If I were to interject a theory of my own here, the one thing the automaton workforce lacked was artificial intelligence, requiring a portion of the population of the Lost Ones to be dedicated to the design, maintenance and repair of the machines that their civilization grew increasingly to rely on. But with the discovery of the reality of other dimensions, parallel planes and the realms of existence beyond the astral and ethereal planes, the youth were not drawn to the study of dull labor of automation resulting in a dwindling workforce and increasing labor shortages in their most vital industry. This prompted one branch of the esoteric scholars and explorers to seek out the answer to this problem and the discovery of the plane of perfection, the clockwork nirvana of Mechanus. Okay, back to the published article. By the way, issue 350 of Dragon Magazine was an excellent um, issue with an article on magic pollution which kind of inspired what I talk about at the end of this video in the form of planet energy saturation stay tuned for that one unknown and ill-fated artificer inspired by the creatures of mechanus took it upon himself to create a mechanical servant an adamantine construct of such intricacy as to rival the inevitables of the clockwork nirvana weaving powerful spells and infusing them into the contraption the masterful lost one inventor bestowed intelligence and unprecedented magical abilities upon the thing granting it life his intentions were pure, if terribly naive. He wished to create the answer to their workforce problem by creating a self-aware and self-replicating servant race. He infused into it the planner power of Mechanus, but unfortunately failed to realize that an ethical, moral, and empathic intelligence requires nurturing and careful indoctrination into a society. One simply cannot flick a switch and then worry about controlling the results later. In gratitude for its creation, the adamantine machine's first act was to destroy its maker, taking control of the vast and secluded workshop which was used to create it. The adamantine horror set to work creating a logically organized workforce that would ensure that their perfected form of life would survive and thrive. It correctly identified its primary form of opposition as all forms of organic life, particularly sapient life forms, and within the span of only a few decades it had amassed a vast horde of mechanical replicants, similar but subservient to itself, each with a purpose, each an extension of its own awareness and intent. When their adamantine master deemed at time legions of platinum gold and lesser horrors flooded the world of unsuspecting lost ones, who really had no defense, or at least no time to put any defense into place against the machine's mechanical monstrosities. 
Many lost ones fled to other planes. Perhaps some do exist today in adapted and altered forms, but if they do, they've never recovered much of a civilization of their own or remain far flung and distant in the prime material plane, far away from the terror which destroyed their cities and reduced their planet to a burnt out wasteland, devoid of mineral deposits, just nothing but vast gouges in the landscape, huge strip mines and mountains of pulverized processed rubble turning into huge deserts. Perhaps... In many realities, that is where the story ended, and perhaps in the D&D multiverse there are many such worlds reduced to husks with massive legions of magical robots just slumbering in vast chambers under the sands. In the case of the homeworld of the Lost Ones, it would have been the same except for the arrival of a spell jamming vessel called a spider ship. A sphere-faring ship of the Nyogi race, slavers who dropped in on an unsuspecting world to hopefully kidnap some victims. Unlike Star Trek, most spell jamming vessels don't have long-range scanners. The Neogi simply landed on the desolate planet and went looking for natives to capture. They soon d encountered a few of the clockwork horrors, some sort of mechanical insects by their estimation. The things ignored them until the cruel Neogi decided to capture a few and take them back to the ship. This was a huge mistake. The Neogi realized at that point that these constructs were all in communication with each other and reacted to the slaver's aggression as one force, instantly attacking in ever-increasing numbers. The Neogi decided a hasty retreat was the best course and made it back to the ship. Unfortunately, they were completely overrun, and not only they, but their entire cargo of living captives, including umber hulks, grey renders, and food slaves, were thoroughly electrocuted and then methodically torn to pieces. Again, perhaps it would have ended there as the horrors had neglected to keep a hostage alive for interrogation. By the time the adamantine horror arrived to assess the situation, there was nobody left alive to tell the horrors just how a spell jamming vessel operates. If it were anything other than a Neogi death spider, the situation probably would have ended there. But several factors about Neogi death spider ships come into play here. First, they are very large ships which have a spider-like appearance and are constructed from a dark crystalline material, so the ship was not immediately stripped of metal and gemstones to be turned into more clockwork horrors. Instead, the adamantine horror spent quite a lot of time carefully examining the thing, which had clearly arrived from somewhere very different. The Death Spider contained a number of urchin chips and extensive holding pens for their living cargo. The spell jamming helm, as is typical of Neogi ships, was not a helm supplied by the race known as the Arcane. It is unknown exactly what type of power propelled the ship, but eventually, after dismantling all of the urchin ships, the adamantine horror figured out how the spell ship operated, and gathered close to 50 tons of other clockwork horrors, refined materials, metals and gemstones, and then took flight in the 175 foot long 100 ton vessel and the invasion of the prime material plane began. From the rare accounts of survivors who have fled worlds invaded by the clockwork horrors, this is what we know for sure. There is only one adamantine horror on the prime material plane, but there are other versions of the adamantine horror that originated in parallel planes of existence. Some of these have crossed over to other planes, and they do tend to work towards exactly the same objectives wherever they originated. No conflict has ever been witnessed among the clockwork horrors. They always work in perfect harmony with each other. All clockwork horrors communicate with each other over a distance of 10 miles. In close proximity, they can also communicate by using a mechanical noise which sounds like simple short and long clicks, similar to the semaphore code but incredibly complex and impossible for anyone to understand apart from mages using magic or beings that understand all forms of language. The semaphore of the clockwork horrors is less a language and more like audible telepathy for their clockwork brains. They are self-aware, a sapient species. The adamantine horror has created a hierarchy of intelligence and free will among the different types of its creations. The power source for each clockwork horror is the sensory gemstone mounted on the head of the construct. These stones are all the same color for each individual type of horror, but no two gems are exactly the same in shade or how they are cut, and they often have very intricate patterns etched into them that are invested with some of the planar energy of Mechanus. In the case of the adamantine horror, this energy is seemingly limitless, and it is the final key to activating all of the horrors. Horrors do not sleep and require no form of nourishment. However, the gold and platinum horrors do need to methodically recharge the lesser horrors with energy once every 30 days of activity. They do this by giving the lesser horrors a jolt of electricity. All clockwork horrors can power down and go into hibernation mode for any length of time, although they require a wake-up discharge of equal to six points of damage 
and they're good to go. Clockwork Horrors have one priority objective, which is to create more of themselves and keep on the move, finding and exploiting new resources. Keeping mobile is a strong component of their survival strategy, but it only takes them a short period of time to wipe out a planet's population and strip mine it down to the bedrock thanks to their geometric reproduction rate. The internal parts and framework of the Clockwork Horrors in all but the Adamanti Horror is based on iron or steel. I've theorized this is very complicated. It's an articulated body that probably contains three clockwork cores, one of which will handle communication, the other two to formulate action sequences according to predicted outcomes. And whenever the whirring mechanisms reach a consensus, all three click out communications and trigger and activate the body. This process is so rapid, the more advanced clockwork horrors have a lot of spare cycles to develop more fanciful and nuanced outcome models which is basically daydreaming and imagination for a clockwork machine, perhaps even some rudimentary emotions. It's very hard to say as they never communicate with other creatures. Each new horror requires 200 pounds of iron or steel with which to construct the main body, along with 100 pounds of precious metal. Additionally, there must be a gemstone worth at least 100 gold pieces, although the actual type of gemstone doesn't matter much as the mineral is transformed when it is infused with planet energy and electricity. Gold and Platinum Horrors with these necessary materials can build new horrors. The lesser horrors, Electrum, Silver and Copper, cannot build new horrors, they have other functions. Constructing a new horror takes three days normally, two of which are the crafting of the main body and mechanisms out of steel. The third day is spent coating the carapace in a layer of precious metal and setting the gemstone. In order to process the metal ore gathered by the lesser horrors, the gold and platinum horror intakes the raw material, smelts it internally, and then exudes it in easily worked web-like strands. The platinum horrors can create all types of, including the gold and other platinum horrors, although it takes no less than four of the platinums working together a week to create another platinum horror. The gold horrors can create electrum and copper horrors, and the other two lesser types I'll later note in this video in my homebrew editions the silver and steel horrors they are merely rumors that the platinum horrors can create an adamantine horror this has never actually been confirmed there is also rumors that multiple specially made platinum horrors can activate other horrors but that's also unconfirmed what is known is that newly constructed horrors will remain inert until they are initially charged and activated by the adamantine horror which must be within five feet to do so and requires all of its attention for a round or so all clockwork horrors will be aware of any other horrors within 10 miles of their location, even if the other horrors are currently shut down. Whatever links them is not psychic or magical in nature. It can't be disrupted by any means that's thus by deemed, been deemed discovered. Even the, uh, the anti-magic eye beam of a beholder will not interrupt this. While the lesser horrors seem to have no problem sacrificing themselves for the common good, gold and platinum horrors do show a greater caution and certainly have a sense of self-preservation. However, their drive is to extract resources and create more of their kind no matter what. They are constantly on the move and they establish scouting and supply search patterns, with the gold and platinum horrors serving as communications relay points to extend the scouting force of Electrum Horrors out beyond 10 miles from the manufacturing workforce of Copper Horrors who will follow directions of the Adamantine Horror and which other horrors to manufacture and which resources to gather, which direction to shift the manufacturing hub to and which leads the scouts Electrum Horrors to follow up depending on the resource requirements so they'll go searching for gold or silver specifically. I'll go over the capabilities of each of the clockwork horror types trying to stay as close to the earlier edition abilities as I can. These things operate in groups that start out difficult and very quickly escalate to nightmare proportions. Particularly in 5th edition you need to pay attention to how many individual horrors are facing your player characters. They're all about overwhelming the enemy with superior numbers and combining their firepower for devastating effect. That's the the, the fearful thing of the clockwork horrors individually not so bad in groups nightmare copper horrors are not particularly intelligent they are the worker drones who have kind of beaten up boxy frames sturdy and plodding they're very strong with their crushing pincers on their limbs and their gemstone is a purple color they tend to have streaks of green verdigris corrosion around their joints they often ignore organic life forms that are not an immediate threat kind of like the borg from star trek they are the workhorses and also occasional cannon fodder. 
Their sense of self-preservation is more limited than the Electrum Gold and Platinum Horrors. Like all clockwork horrors, their head has a powerful buzzsaw located under it that counts as a magical weapon inflicting 1d6 slashing damage. Copper horrors have an armor class of 15, 66 plus 6 for a maximum of 42 and an average of 27 hit points, and a speed of 30 feet per round. The copper horrors are not quite as agile as other clockwork horrors and don't have the capacity to spider climb or move uh, in a stealthy fashion. They spend most of their time rendering down metal, mining, moving debris and hauling ore for processing within their internal compartments which are larger than other kinds of uh, clockwork horror. They transport ore back to the established manufacturing areas where the gold and platinum horrors are hard at work assembling new horrors as fast as they can. All clockwork horrors have a vulnerability to the spell called Shatter. A level 2 evocation spell with a 60 foot range that requires a small chip of mica as the material component. The spell produces a very loud, sudden and painfully intense ringing noise, creating a 10 foot sphere of vibration that causes any creature which fails a constitution saving throw to take 3d8 thunder damage, with inorganic materials such as stone, crystal or metal having disadvantage on the saving throw. In the case of Clockwork Horrors, that's all true, failing the saving throw also results in blindness of the unit for 1d4 plus run rounds. Keeping in mind that thanks to having minds that are linked to each other, it's possible for gold or higher horrors to direct the blinded horrors, which can at least then move around without falling off cliffs and such, but they still had disadvantage on any attacks or actions they perform which require skill checks. Once per day, a copper horror can generate an effect similar to a shocking grasp spell, delivering a 1d8 lightning damage on a successful melee attack. They're not very good fighters, they only have a plus 3 to hit with their pincers which inflict 1d4 plus 3 bludgeoning damage and are capable of grappling a target they hit. Their physical strength is 16 but they can lift and carry 1.5 times what a human can with the same strength thanks to being quadrupeds. All the horrors are constructs, they are immune to poison and psychic damage as well as being immune to being charmed, exhausted, frightened, paralysed or petrified. Plus, they have damage resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing attacks. All horrors have 60-foot dark vision. The copper horrors are of the same size as all the other horrors, with a body about two feet wide and about the same in height when they crouch down and move around. They can rear up and perch on their rear limbs and reach as high as six feet with their front limbs, but they are incapable of bipedal movement. All of the, the horrors are the same size. Electrum horrors are the scouts. They have the green gemstone and a similar blocky construction of their body to the coppers, but with a more golden and bright sheen to their metal coating. They have the same hit points as the cop horror, but their armor class is only 14. In exchange for less armoring, they are more agile with the ability to spider climb and with a normal movement speed of 40 feet per round. The Electrum Horrors are equipped with a special dart launcher that has a normal range of 30 feet and a long range of 60 feet. They are plus 2 to hit with the launcher and inflict 2d4 piercing damage. The razor sharp buzzsaw is the same as the Copper Horrors. Electrum Horrors are a bit smarter than the Copper Horrors. They are often tasked with hunting down settlements of humanoids and lairs of draconic creatures as both are rich sources of precious metals and gemstones. Electrum horrors advance into combat in precision battle lines, with the individual horrors spaced exactly 10 feet apart. They often open fire with volleys of pressure darts, and upon closing with the enemy, can continue firing darts at perceived spellcasters or opponents using ranged weapons, while the others will slice away at nearby foes with their razor-sharp saws. After a battle, additional Electron Horrors scavenge the area, retrieving fallen companions and any abandoned weaponry for smelting down and making new horrors. It's a diminishing return though, it takes about 4 dead horrors to create a new one from the resources that they gather, so there's a bit of waste involved. Gold Horrors have a blue gemstone, the same armor class as the Copper Horrors, but a few more hit points thanks to the very durable internal shielding they have for their metal smelting and forming components. They are 8d6 plus 6 for a maximum of 54 and an average of 34 hit points. Their body shape is more smooth and well crafted with seemingly decorative etched patterns in their carapace, but we know nothing on these creatures is there for impractical reasons. It's just nobody knows what the etched patterns exactly are for. Gold horrors serve not only as communication relays and manufacturing units for the bulk of the clockwork horror workforce, they also situate themselves in a good vantage point in combat situations behind a protective line of Electrum horror guards. 
The gold horrors will then unleash a bolt of lightning once every two rounds. It's not as powerful as the lightning bolt spell. It has a range of 40 feet and the victims must make a DC 15 dexterity saving throw or take 66 lightning damage or half on a successful save. If a gold horror enters into melee combat range, its buzzsaw has the qualities of a plus two magic weapon. Also, the gold horror, if fighting an armed creature, can choose to deal no damage with the attack but instead force the target to make a DC 14 strength saving throw. If the target fails, they will drop one item they are holding to the ground. This is a disarm attack. In the case of the gold and platinum and adamantine horrors buzz saws, they all inflict double damage to inanimate objects and structures. Gold and platinum horrors also have resistance to magic damage and make all their saving throws versus magic with advantage. Perhaps that is the purpose of the mysterious etched patterns on their bodies. Platinum horrors have a yellow gemstone and are the most intelligent and independent horrors under the adamantine horrors integral remote control. Platinum horrors are the generals and governors of the lesser hor clockwork horrors workforce. It's they who identify targets, devise strategies, and decide how to best deploy the other horrors to achieve their goals. They are also capable of firing lightning bolts from rods mounted on their back. The, these versions shoot a much more powerful, which is actually equivalent to the spell lightning bolt. Still, with a relatively low dexterity saving throw of 16 to avoid taking full damage in their victims. There are also two more clockwork horror types I will mention later, and then there's the adamantine horror, a unique individual that directs the harvesting of metal and the creation of new horrors. The adamantine horror has a red gemstone that is a font of planar energy of Mechanus. It is the supreme leader of all clockwork horrors and keeps the secret of how the artificial race's numbers are maintained, and only it knows the deep secrets of the mysterious gemstones and how they are transformed by its planar power. Much as insects show no remorse or conscience when their hive members perish, neither does the adamantine horror appear to care how many of its offspring die in pursuit of its entire race's goals. It seems clear now that the clockwork horrors have evolved beyond the need to travel using a captured Miyogi spell jamming ship, and also, given their infamy across the multiverse, they have either been at this for a very long time, or there is some way that more adamantine horrors have been re replicated and have set off in different directions to expand their crusade of extermination and replication to the farthest reaches of reality. Okay, so now that the official and adapted from official sources lore is covered, let's take a look at a few of my suggestions for expansions to the clockwork horror lore. The first thing that I thought of as soon as I read about their, their method of extruding their metal components as metal webbing, I thought, well, then why would they not string the stuff up as a weaponized form of sensitive wires around the areas and operations, which is both a trap and an alert system. The razor wire is between three inches and three feet off the ground and stretches between two boulders or columns or trees. The wire is very thin and may be concealed by foliage or other loose wire wafting around the area. The DC to spot the razor wire is 13. A successful DC 15 dexterity check using thieves tools breaks the razor wire harmlessly. A character without thieves tools can attempt the check with a disadvantage using edged weapons or an edged tool. On a failed check the wire snaps and lashes back to the victim inflicting 3d10 slashing damage. Unless they succeed on a DC 15 dexterity saving throw to a uh, leap out of the way taking half damage instead. When triggered, any clockwork horrors within 120 feet of the area will be alerted to the presence of intruders. I pondered what would be a cool objective if the clockwork horrors reached Toril and discovered ancient stone monoliths, planar portals of the Batraki or Emaskari empires or similar technology from activated ruins. And I thought one goal of the Adamantine horror is to gather the resources and information to construct a clockwork gateway that creates planar portals through the magic of Mechanus and specifically created massive tuning forks that create a vibrational attunement to another plane of existence, creating a two-way gateway between dimensions. The ultimate objective is to create Mechanus portals for each world the horrors invade, leading either to Archeron or the elemental plane of Earth, uh, providing nearly unlimited resources for the creation of endless legions of horrors. So far, the Adamantine Horror has not found the right components for this task, as it has assumed all parts of the portals must be made out of metal and precious gemstones, which is not actually the case. The vital component of this type of portal is simply quartz crystal. Also, over-reliance on Mechanus Energy will shut down planet portals as they are not authorised by the divine directions of Primus. 
Finally, there are more types of horrors than the monster manuals reveal to us. They even state in the official law that lesser variations exist for more specific tasks. So one of which is the silver horrors. These are quite similar to the electrum horrors, but they specialize in the, the extermination of organic life. They appear similar to the electrum horrors, except they are more lean and vicious looking and have the same elaborate patterns on their carapace seen on the gold and platinum horrors, which provides them with spell resistance. Their four limbs are edged weapons and their buzzsaw blade is enhanced with the ability to fire spinning bladed discs at targets. Their gemstone is orange. Silver Horror's primary objective is to locate specific metals within inhabited areas and assassinate all organic targets that pose any kind of threat to the Clockwork Horror Swarm. And unfortunately, they include all humanoids in that. I contemplated situations in which the Swarm would calculate the resources cost of producing workers quickly and throwing them into extremely hazardous environments. I came up with the steel clockwork horrors, created for extremely hazardous environments which contain rich sources of metals and precious gems. The steel clockwork horrors are not constructed with the expectation that they're going to remain operational for very long, but the resources spent creating them is more than repaid in the resources they can deliver. Steel clockwork horrors have all of the usual internal complexity and have very well shielded crystal that is dark brown. They don't have any special offensive weaponry but like the copper horrors their tough pincer limbs can tear apart flesh and armour as well as they can render down stone or scoop up cooling lava. Steel horrors are deployed in chaotic asteroid belts where the risk of being pulverised at any moment is very high. They also get sent into volcanic areas and occasionally are just used as simple components such as grabbing and locking two large metal plates or hunks of rock together to form an enclosed foundry area, say in an area which has been bombarded by meteors. In situations where there are hundreds of copper or electrum horrors being destroyed, the appearance of steel horrors with their thick carapace protection and lumbering bulk is a clear sign that the clockwork swarm is doggedly determined to take whatever objective is putting up so much resistance to their inexorable advance. Unlike the other clockwork horrors, the swarm only creates them as needed. They never stockpile deactivated steel horrors in bunkers or transport them to other locations. They just create them on the spot. Additional tweaks to apply to your clockwork horror boss encounter. Should the players get anywhere near the adamantine horror itself, I suggest taking inspiration from the wondrous item called the clockwork amulet. It allows a wearer to forego rolling a random d20 for their attack roll, instead automatically using a result of 10 plus any bonuses they may have once per day. In the case of the clockwork horrors, this could mean the adamantine horror can select any and all clockwork horrors within visual range of itself and no more than 10 miles away and have them use a result of 10 plus their attack bonus instead of rolling a random d20. It's not so bad against the player characters, but this if this results in a hit on a player character class, you can imagine how devastating this effect would be. And also against like civilians and uh, stationary targets and things like that, absolutely devastating. Another thing to keep in mind is the planet energy. As the clockwork horrors contain and generate a fairly large amount of power to run themselves and do things like process ore into metals and forge the metal into precision parts. Remember, they're not using fuel, they're being fueled by an outside source. There are two byproducts for this. One is heat. The other is a growing saturation of Mechanus's lawful neutral influence on reality itself, which is far more weird than you might imagine. On the cog worlds of the perfect clockwork nirvana of Mechanus, everything is in order. Nothing is chaotic. Everything fits together perfectly and runs smoothly and absolutely on time, no matter what. Being exposed to this influence can alter matter on the prime material plane. The first telltale sign is when you splash water and it lands in perfectly equal globs and all the droplets are the same size and land on the ground at exactly the same time and are arranged in an orderly pattern. Travellers lost in the wilderness will not wander in random directions. They will march directly north or south or east. Clouds will, will turn into spheres of mist that break apart into smaller spheres and will get to the point that even liquid substances will seem to form crystalline shapes as they move and the thoughts and actions of those within the saturated area will be strongly influenced by lawful principles. They'll follow rules, they'll not deviate from plans, they'll operate in strict hierarchies and so on. It will also heavily influence the effect of magic, which is quite at odds with dominant lawful planet energies. And I suggest to you that let the players know that when their characters are casting spells, they are feeling a huge amount of drag, like every spell now requires much more effort. An easy way to represent this without worrying about each individual spell is just to require every spell to use a higher level spell slot. 
This is brutal to characters who rely on spellcrafting. At the same time, mundane structural and movement based elements of the game are getting very weird. For example, metal objects become really durable and tough. So anyone wearing metal armor or using a weapon uh, will treat them as though they are adamantine. Missile weapons strike with advantage and there is a planet influence on them hitting their target or missing completely. They're just one or the other. Characters will sleep for exactly eight hours. All paper will tear in exactly straight and even lines. Rope thrown into the air will land and naturally fall into a perfect coil. You get the idea. The more clockwork horrors are operating in an area and the longer they've been operating there, the heavier the saturation of lawful planet energy, which in turn makes it easier for them to transform ore into metal, metal into precision parts, and assemble them rapidly into new clockwork horrors. So what previously took three days now takes a day and a half. Even when all the clockwork horrors are destroyed, this planet energy takes a while to bleed off and be absorbed by the primaterial plane. But generally it fades away within a week or so, so it's a regional effect. So it extends out six miles, and within one mile of the most intense clockwork horror activity, so their foundries, it will take the most dramatic effects, such as crystalline wood, which stays that way even after the planet energy is gone. If things are getting really out of hand, there are some big multiversal guns that will get involved. This is fun because you can hardly ever see planet forces come charging in like the cavalry, but the ultimate custodians of planet neutrality, the golden-skinned Rilmani, will begin to arrive in the area in ever-increasing numbers. They can't arrive at all at once because they are restricted to only portaling into the primaterial plane when a creature of cosmic chaos or law crosses over, as their role has always been to keep the status quo of the multiverse. The clockwork horrors are well known to the real Nani, and while they can probably single out and destroy the Adamantine horror, they simply don't for whatever greater reason. That's, they've never done it. When they get involved, they are not there to interact with or serve the needs of the player characters, they are there to restore balance, and unfortunately <laughs> that means countering an excess of lawfulness with a hell of a lot of chaos. So they portal in demons and slardy. Player characters are best advised to get out of the area as quickly as possible and take as many ordinary bystanders with them as they can. Once the absolute mayhem dies down, the real Marnie will proceed to banish the demons and Slardy back to the outer planes, hitchhiking on their coattails back to the concordant plane of Outland and the spire in the centre of the multiverse, above which floats the city of Sigil. If you have any complaints about their conduct, you will have to submit a large collection of paperwork to their interminable bureaucracy. <laughs> Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Subscribestar or Patreon for links for all the full scripts for these videos, buy some Teespring merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.